I'm Rachel, a Block 3 student at BDLs studying history. I'm really excited about the opportunity to meet Jeremy Paxman, renowned journalist, broadcaster and author. Jeremy has recently presented a BBC series about the First World War, entitled Britain's Great War. Jeremy, could you tell me a bit about the series and what first drew you to the project? Well, as you know, it's 100 years since the start of the First World War, and I just um, thought that it was time to try to go back to first principles, because it seems to me that what's happened over the course of the century since the war began is that we've all decided what we think about it, and what we think about it is really filtered through a through a prism of, of, of ideas that are really not from the time at all. They all start, starts 1920s, 1930s, people having a particular view that the whole thing was pointless sacrifice, lions led by donkeys in the old saying. And um, I thought that when I, th when I considered the First World War, I realized that what I was thinking about was not the event itself, but a series of accumulated prejudices over the years and I just thought it was time we should go back to first principles and try to find out what it was really like uh, for those who were living at the time and to try to make it real for people because I think this is the event that, you know, this kind of the event that made modern Britain really. If you'd been a you know, Victorian time traveller and you'd come back in 1914, you would recognise Britain and you would understand how it worked. But if you came back, say, 10 years later in the middle of the 1920s, I think you'd have found a very different country, you would certainly have found a very different country, and you would have understood much, much less about why, why it was as it was and how it worked. So I think this is the big event that makes modern Britain, really, um, for a number of reasons, not just because it was a cataclysm, which took immense numbers of lives, but also because it, the whole relationship between individuals and authority what the role of government was, all these, all these relationships hugely changed during that time. And, you know, we should understand that, really, if we want to understand how things are now. I mean, you're a historian, but, so you believe in history, but I, I'm really rather shocked by how little history so many people know nowadays, and I think history matters. You obviously think history matters, yeah. but... I mean, I think history matters because I don't think you can understand where we're going unless you understand where we've come from. While you were doing your research for the programme, was there any people or places you visited that were really memorable? Well, that's the sort of question that I find really difficult to answer because it's such an open question. And the truth is, I think... I've always thought this, and I still think it now, that anywhere you go uh, is interesting in itself, and any person you meet has a story to tell. And so, because I have a, you know, I work in a, a very, very, very transitory sort of trade, uh, which responds to a daily stimulus. So I would tend to give you an answer that wasn't really thought properly through. Uh, I would say, whatever it is, I will say it'll be the most recent thing. But actually, I think wherever you go, I was astonished, for example, uh, in the first programme, the researcher had managed to find a, an old lady of 105 who, when she was seven years old, had been in Hartlepool. She still lived in Hartlepool. And... In December 1914, the German Navy got three battleships, or three battle cruisers, inside the British defensive cordon. And at breakfast time, one December morning, suddenly this old lady, who was then seven years old and was living in a house right on the seafront, she heard these bangs and she said to her mother, Mother, somebody's beating their carpets. You know, they used to hang carpets on the washing line and hit them to knock the dust out of them before hoovers. And um, her mother said, no, that's not somebody beating their carpets. And so she looked back out to see again. And then she saw these flashes. And then she realised that there was a connection between the flash and the bang. Uh, and the next thing she saw, and this was the really striking detail, I thought, it was, as I say, just before Christmas, December the 14th, December the 17th, something like that. 
and there was this torrent of people suddenly coming down the street because the shells were landing from these ships and people were dying. They were hitting houses and people were being killed inside them. So people were pouring out of their houses, running down the street and there were parents dragging children, mothers pushing prams. And this was the striking detail. The striking detail was because it was a week or so before Christmas, a lot of them were carrying cake tins holding the Christmas cakes that they had just baked. And of course they were no safer in the street than they were in their houses because nobody knew where the shells were going to land. Uh, and over you know, 100 people were killed. And you know, who'd have thought that Hartlepool would provide a striking memory? Uh, it's a lot less glamorous than some places you might go to, but you know, that's, that happens to be fresh in my memory today. If you ask me tomorrow, I'd say something else probably. It's quite a hard subject to make a documentary about. Did no, you it's ever not. find? Well, in some ways, it is. Why? Everyone has different opinions of what happened, and there's some very traumatic experiences for people. Yeah. So, in some ways, people who were in it may think it hasn't been broached in an appropriate manner, and people who were in it may think it was it's been done. Well, there's virtually no one alive no. who was in yeah, it. Yeah, but. Uh, but that's no excuse. Um, I don't know that it was done inappropriately. It's not actually that difficult if you're prepared to do yeah. the work. There are still, there are amazing numbers of stories about the First World War that have still, even now, not been, not been published. There were vast numbers of diaries and journals kept. There have been th literally thousands yeah. of books published on the subject. And, you know, all of those... We don't concentrate, I'm, I'm interested in what it did to Britain, we don't concentrate on, on the military history so much. But all those young men, there were five and a half million men who served in the, in the, in the forces. Vast numbers of them sent letters home. And they give a very telling account of what life was like if you were on a ship or in a frontline trench or flying in an aeroplane. Very, very vivid accounts, uh, many of which were kept, of course. The problem is that what it wasn't kept was the letters from people at home to their loved ones at the front, because you can you can imagine it. You know, you're living in pretty horrible conditions, and you know, who's going to keep scraps of paper from from their families at home? That's the bit that's really missing. The accounts of people who are trying to reassure their loved ones, from we see from the letters that survive, they were trying to reassure their loved ones that life was going on perfectly normally at home and you know, Auntie Mabel was alright and the dog had been ill or died or something, uh, the harvest was okay or wasn't okay. Um, these, it was very difficult to, 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 to send a message to someone who was experiencing this utter hell because there was such a chasm between the country they were fighting for and the life that they were living. Thank you very much for your time. I've really enjoyed talking to you. Well, I've enjoyed talking to you. Two long answers, eh? <laughs> you should have said, get on with it.